maybe not so many since it's a college campus, would remember the public service announcement, this is your brain on drugs, and they show a fried egg. It's maybe a little more complicated than that. <laughs> There's a lot of biochemistry involved in drug abuse and addiction, and it matters where you come from, it matters your pre previous experiences, and it matters how your brain processes these chemicals. Now, there are other things that your brain processes that it also finds very important, and one of those is glucose. That's the blood sugar uh, levels that affect how you are able to function. If you don't have glucose, you die. Your body goes into survival mode when you don't have it, and so some of us, our body does this a little bit early, we get hangry. Now, uh, this is a picture uh, of me, and two pictures. You can see a little bit of a difference between the two. The first uh, is in Machu Picchu, in Peru, where I have been hiking with my uh, soon-to-be fiancé, who is trying desperately to make it so that we're having a good time, so that he can find a good time to propose. Um, I would not propose to this woman. <laughs> But luckily, because he's amazing husband material, he knows what the difference is between a happy me and a hangry me. And all that is, is some trail mix. Uh, these days, maybe a nice dinner. Um, so he's able to give me some trail mix, and about two minutes later, I'm a human being again. Suddenly, I can function. Where I am, who I'm with, what I'm doing, all of these matter again, instead of this overwhelming need for food, for blood sugar. And when your body is addicted to substances like opioids, this is a similar process. A few years ago, I broke my collarbone, and I had a metal implant and some nasty surgery, and I was given opioids to help with the pain, and that was great. Uh, I felt especially great at the time, but <laughs> uh, I didn't have uh, necessarily a propensity to uh, become addicted to them. And initially, people don't. You generally can keep things in balance, like your food, your family, your friends, your job. All of these things are okay, in addition to the need for this medication. But if you're abusing these drugs, or you do have a propensity, uh, because of your prior history of trauma or uh, a genetic propensity for this, this balance is much harder to maintain. And so some of these things start dropping out. Suddenly these hobbies don't seem so important to you. Suddenly the job doesn't seem as important. And uh, if this continues, you come into overpowering addiction, where the only thing that you can think about is this need for these opiates, this need for drugs. And who you are, who you're with, what you're doing, none of these things matter anymore. And that's all that you can concentrate on. Well, unfortunately, 23 million Americans suffer from a substance abuse problem, whether that's illicit drugs or prescription medications or alcohol. And despite their best efforts, only about 11% are getting the treatment that they need. And of those 11%, 40 to 60% of them are going to relapse, even though they have case managers, even though they're working really hard. Nobody is choosing to relapse with the rational part of their mind. So there's a lot of processes that go on in attempting to overcome this chronic disease. So I mentioned case management. There's mental health care because there's a often other problems uh, in your life that you have to be dealing with. There's emergency care in case of overdose. There's a lot of pharmaceutical therapies, uh, family services, legal services, vocational services to get you back on track. But something that we have every day and we tend to take for granted tends to be missing. Most of us have on our person at least one computer at any given time these days, whether that's in the form of your smartphone or your smartwatch, these technologies are everywhere, but they're not often used in mental health in the way that they are in so many other parts of medical um, 
services. So if you are somebody who is abusing uh, drugs, you're going to have to go through a painful withdrawal process to attempt to get to this recovery phase. But we already know that many people are going to relapse no matter what, and a number of them may overdose before they get into long-term recovery. So I want to talk about how we can fit technologies into each of these stages to help support people in their attempt at recovery, to make them successful. So first, uh, we have a number of people abusing in the community. And everybody thinks, oh, but not our community. Well, yes, our community. This is a problem here. And this is an app that some of my colleagues have developed to work with law enforcement agencies and policymakers to understand where the problems are occurring. Um, and here you can see that it's pointed out controlled substance use in this map in our town, and they're able to detect that. That means they know where to patrol. That means they know where they can target services. And by knowing this information, you can convince people that this is a problem, and you can convince them that these are the places that you need to treat it. For those who have decided that they want to go into recovery, I mentioned that withdrawal is painful. It is nothing that you would choose to do unless you know that there is something better for you on the other side. It involves nausea, vomiting, cramping, all of these nasty things that you go through for about four days, even a week. There are some pharmaceutical therapies that help reduce these symptoms, but they don't work for everybody, and they can have their own side effects. An emerging technology uh, that I recently heard about is electroceuticals. These, this is an example of uh, the neurostimulation bridge device. And what it is, it fits behind your ear, and it stimulates various nerves in your brain to help reduce those symptoms. And so it's, I think it's fascinating, because I'm an engineer and I like technology. Uh, and it works by stimulating the nerves, and that reduces the nausea, and it reduces the pain. Because one of the things that happens when you're going off of painkillers is that your sensitivity to pain actually increases, which is a horrible catch-22 especially if you're on them initially because you were in pain. So these types of technologies reduce that type of symptom. And the FDA has recently approved this. Um, so now this is something that's out there as another alternative for pharmaceutical therapies. Um, and now I want to talk about some of the stuff that we're working in uh, my lab. And it's a little further away from FDA approval and being uh, seen any time in the clinic, but we think it can really make a lot of differences. Now, when you have uh, gone into an overdose, your respiration decreases. Your heart rate may stay somewhat similar, but really what happens is your body forgets one of the few things that it has known how to do since birth, and that is breathe. So your respiration becomes erratic, and you no longer get the oxygen that you need into your body, and you essentially suffocate. So what we want to be able to do is treat people before that happens. But first, you have to be able to detect it. Now, we have, I have a smartwatch. A number of you, I'm sure, have them, right? Yes? Uh, what those do is they detect your heart rate. And it's impressive, because they can pull out your heart sig the Higgs signal of your heartbeat from all of the noise that this is detecting. When you're moving your arm, when you're walking, when you're stopping and starting, even when you're breathing, all of these things affect the signal that these, are these watches are able to see. And they're able to pull out the heart rate from that. So if you ever wonder why your watch is maybe not as accurate as you would like it to be, this is why. There are lots of algorithms and filters happening uh, to make it work, and they're getting much better. They're not perfect, but at this point, usually my watch doesn't realize uh, and think that I have died just because I stopped swinging my arm. Um, now, respiration is one of the things that affects this signal, and, but respiration affects it at a very much smaller portion of this, and it's got more noise behind it. 
So uh, some graduate students in my lab are doing some excellent work pulling out that signal from the noise. Um, and this is an example of one of them wearing the smartwatch that he designed, and he can measure his own normal breathing, the difference between short, choppy breath, and even holding his breath. And so if you can do this in a smartwatch, and you can connect that to, say, a phone or uh, even a closed-loop system, you can call for help. You could get emergency services to quickly provide an antidote. Or, in this closed-loop system, we're working with colleagues who could provide the antidote without anyone else having to be around to revive people and prevent the overdoses that occur every single day. Um, another technology that I'm really excited about uh, is better understanding and developing personalized care for people who are um, addicts and are trying to recover. We know that stressful events in your life will affect the cravings to use drugs. We know that if you're having fun with friends, you're feeling fulfilled, your job is making you uh, feel like you know what you want to be doing with your life, these things make it easy to not feel these cravings. Even I can get through a whole day without eating lunch if I'm excited about what I'm doing and I'm keeping busy. But if you're in a high-stress situation, if you're having to pass the places that you used to use drugs or purchase drugs, if you're working uh, and hanging around with the people that you used to use with, it's really hard to forget that part of your life. And so, what we've been working with collaborators who are working with addicts who are currently uh, either waiting to get into rehab because there tends to be a line, we don't have enough services for them, or they're in rehab now and they're letting our collaborators track their phones and they fill out surveys about their cravings, they fill out surveys about when they've used, and they submit to drug tests voluntarily, all in the hope that their efforts will improve addiction management for other people. And this is fantastic. But right now, the problem is that we can see when they are stressed. We can see where they go, but we don't know when, over that long week that they've had um, an opportunity to use drugs, when exactly that drug use may have occurred. All we know is that, yes, this week they did, no, last week they didn't. So if we could have a time-resolved way to monitor when people are using drugs, you would be able to measure both that stress response and if that led to drug use. And if you know when that happens, you know how long you have to intervene. You know that a case manager could call and say, hey, maybe not today, maybe we should talk. Or a mentor could come to you and say, let's stop and have coffee. Let's take a break. You do not have to succumb to these cravings. So what we're doing in my lab uh, is developing a sweat-based method that can do this. So you could unobtrusively have something, um, maybe like a Band-Aid that sits uh, somewhere and passively monitors the substances that you may or may not be taking. I am not taking any substances right now. But uh, the idea is that you uh, measure uh, one of these uh, devices on your arm or elsewhere, and it's got both uh, some paper that absorbs the sweat into it and passes it over an electrode, and some electronics that are able to decipher this and talk to a phone or call for help. What this works like is there's a, a it's an electrochemical test. There's a voltage that you see, and there's a, a current that occurs at uh, each of these specific voltages. And this is a baseline. So when it's just measuring sweat, it would have this little bump in the middle. But if you take drugs, and in this case, it's, it's detecting cocaine in the solution, that increases, and it can detect this difference in signals. If those drugs get washed out of your system, that goes back down to baseline. And now we know that in that period, you're no longer on drugs. 
And if you start using them again, it goes back up. So this gives us a time-resolved and repeatable way to measure substance abuse in someone without them having to do anything. So with these technologies, we're going to be able to do things like provide better support to the millions of people who are trying to overcome this chronic addiction. Thank you.